I really, really strongly would recommend my students to have that app. Today, on Journalism Showcase, cell phones are moving from novelty to educational tools. One year we raised $1,635 and about 700 pounds of food. A haunted house is collecting food for the local food bank. And later, students at NBCC campuses have more resources when on a tight food budget. It's critical to the success of the students. Hello, I'm Ethan Hazlitt. Welcome to MBCC Journalism Showcase, produced entirely by New Brunswick Community College students. Throughout the program, we'll be looking at work that we've done in the fall of 2011. Healthy eating can be expensive, and for students who are already on a limited budget, it can be much more difficult. Tony Bourgeois looks into what students can do to stay healthy and keep fed. For many students, what's for dinner is what's fast and cheap. And for the most part, it is not the healthiest of food. Honestly, I don't think I'm a healthy eater. I don't really get the money to buy a lot of healthy food, so I just usually eat TV dinners and... Just cost, just more of like uh, accessibility, you know? I'd rather grab something I can quickly throw in the microwave than something that's going to take me half an hour to cook. The healthier, fresher foods are the ones that can cost more at the grocery store. Some students will not buy the healthy foods. They say the risk the food will spoil before they can eat it is just too high. Wendy Cummings says healthy choices begin with nutrition awareness. I've been really working on cooking classes here to educate people to be able to say what can I have that's cheap and inexpensive. Cummings believes most food can be split up into two categories. Real food and consumable product. Edible products are foods with high calories that don't really do much for your body. Real food is exactly what your body needs. Cummings also believes that some foods you're likely to crave just are not so good for you. I think I'd have to say the biggest culprit for disease and illness and uh, breaking down your immune system is sugar. Cummings says it's important to find alternatives to sugary snacks. A chocolate bar can cost a dollar each, when an apple or a banana can cost as low as 50 cents. In Woodstock, Tony Bourgeois, Community College News. It's often chilly on Halloween, a reminder that winter is quickly settling in. Homeowners are already looking for ways to stay warm without wasting cash. Jill Constantine looks at ways that you can cover a few bucks off your power bill. Jeff Matheson is an energy evaluator. He says the biggest mistake people make is substituting energy efficiency for resale value or beautification. And a lot of people will cover something up in favor of making it look pretty and neglect things like insulation. And that's a big, that's a big mistake. Hector Doron with Efficiency New Brunswick says about one third of your home's heat leaks out through small cracks. But he says even on a tight budget, you can make your home more efficient. If you don't have a, a big budget, you can buy, uh, for an example, a plastic shield that would go over window. So you may not be able to replace the window, but you can still stop the wind from coming through. The south of the house is, is here and all the, uh, it's all windows facing south. For homeowner Richard O'Leary, efficiency has always been a concern. Three years ago, he built a new home that runs off solar energy. He has cut his heating bill by one quarter. O'Leary believes that everyone should have their homes inspected by an energy evaluator. Some people are reluctant to pay for expensive upgrades, but he insists that it's a money saver in the long run. In St. John, Jill Constantine, Community College News. Pantene, Dove and Axe, all common household names for soaps and shampoos. What most consumers don't know is that these good smelling hygiene products could be adding to the water pollution and other health concerns. Jocelyn Turner has more. If you're not taking care of your health with your money, what else do you really have to spend your money on? It's like if you lose your health, you've lost pretty much everything. You've lost your quality of life. You've potentially lost your life. Rish McGlynn is worried about the impact chemical-based products such as shampoos will have on the health of her family. A report on David Suzuki's website says these everyday soaps and shampoos are adding more toxins to our water supply. One of the ingredients in cleaning products is sodium lorith sulfate. The International Agency for Research on Cancer says the chemical may cause cancer. But the Government of Canada says the amount of the chemical in soaps and shampoos is probably too low to have an effect. Yes, there, there are all kinds of preservatives and everything like that in it, but also parabens and SLS, sodium lauryl sulfate, 
which has been known to be detrimental to our health, and parabens have actually been said by some to be carcinogens, cancer-causing agents. And this is the Morrison Lake. Simon Mitchell is the Meduxna Keg River Association Program Coordinator. He agrees with McGlynn and says consumers should be aware of what's in the cleaners and soaps they use. You can take some precautions to keep water clean. The, the first step is, is reduction. The second step uh, is switching to a, to a biodegradable uh, soap, although those still can contain organics, which... Um, uh, don't break down in the in the system very well. The Conservation Council agrees with Mitchell. They both say biodegradable products are better for the environment, but they are not completely safe. Biodegradable doesn't mean it's not going to cause environmental damage. It's not a sufficient um, uh, way of, of making your decisions. Mitchell says chemical-based products are just part of the problem. The amount of toxins in our water systems depend on how much soap and shampoo is used when washing. As, as, a, as a human population, we generally like to be fairly clean or certainly cleaner now than we, we have been in the past. Um, and that, uh, that compounds the problem because it's promoting more of the cleaning than, than uh, maybe is what, necess what is necessary. There are some environmentally friendly options for concerned consumers. If you're trying to make the right environmental choice, you really need to, the best bet is to, to look for the EcoLogo and, and buy those products. The EcoLogo label was created by the Canadian government. The products under the label are environmentally safe to use. The EcoLogo label means that the product has met uh, uh, specific criteria and standards established um, um, uh, for... Uh, for uh, the EcoLogo program. The EcoLogo website details the criteria products met to display the EcoLogo label. My products, I'm proud to say, are 100% natural, all scented with essential oils. I know exactly what's in them, where it comes from. It's safe to use on me and the kids. I have no worries about it. So Sandra Habold makes her own all-natural soaps and shampoos and sells them. It's shops like these that McGlynn relies on to keep her household environmentally friendly. And most people would think that going to a natural option would be a lower quality, although you're paying more for it. But I'm actually finding, because I have a three-year-old daughter, we have her with NatureGate um, organic shampoo and organic conditioner, and it works beautifully. Different soaps are needed for different skin types. Habold knows exactly what is in each bar of soap so she can recommend the right bar for anyone. Soap, any type of soap is always going to be made with, made with fats and lye. Um, so whether it be animal based fats, which we don't use, or vegetables. So olive oils, coconut oils, uh, soybean oils, there's th the list of vegetable oils are extensive and they each offer their own benefits to that bar of soap. McGlynn says switching to all natural products was an easy decision. She chose her health over commercial soaps and shampoos, saying those products harm our bodies and the environment. And since you are what you eat and you are what is absorbed in through the largest organ of your body being your skin, then that is really where we should start with our preventative measures of trying to keep ourselves healthy and happy and safe. Consumers can check the back of the bottle. This list of ingredients can show you exactly what's going down the drain and potentially into our drinking water. In Woodstock, Jocelyn Turner, Community College News. College students often find creative ways to eat on a limited budget. But eating cheaply does not always mean eating well. MBCC Woodstock is now offering an on-site food bank to help students stretch the food dollars. Jeff Stairs has more. For some students, a visit to the grocery store means picking up a few inexpensive items and hoping they last through the week. Fresh, healthy items don't always fit into their budget. Capitol Square residence caretaker Debbie Bustard says while some students have families looking after their well-being, others aren't so lucky. Some students or parents make sure every week or two weeks they get new groceries and all that. But then we have the students that only have a little bit of money. And in a very short time, their money is gone. NBCC Woodstock has introduced an on-campus food bank program to help financially stretch students improve their diets. Located here in room 1100, the bank contains an assortment of non-perishable food items. MBCC faculty member Paul Carter says that the need for nutritional aid for students is becoming increasingly evident. A lot of students this year have 
been late receiving their, their student loans and that sort of thing. And so they're living on a pretty limited budget to start out with. Um, I think healthy eating is the part of a productive day, part of a productive uh, work in, during your day, and uh, I, it's critical to the success of the students. Carter urges any student experiencing financial difficulties to speak to an instructor or their school's counselor. While other MBCC campuses have not yet established a similar program, many have other systems in place for student assistance. In Woodstock, Jeff Stairs, Community College News. When we come back, Kyle DuPont looks at the misconceptions about distractions while studying. Hello, I am Monica Boucher. And I'm Marissa Boucher from St. Mary's Academy. We visited the New Brunswick Community College in Woodstock. And we toured the journalism program and others. My favorite program is our journalism. And mine is graphic design. For more NBCC news stories, go to jschoolnbcc.ca. For more of our work, visit jschoolnbcc.ca. The site features stories from the NBCC Woodstock Journalism Program, including past shows from earlier this year. Welcome back. Exam time can be more challenging for students. The study crunch can often compete with so many social distractions. Kyle DuPont has more. Computers and the internet are unique tools for learning, but these tools can also be distracting. Internet savvy students may have trouble concentrating when trying to study. Noise. Can't work in an environment that is not friendly to studying or easily distracting. Facebook and cell phones and TV, but my kids are a big one. It's tempting to go on and get away from the work sometimes, just get distracted. Many students have a misconception about studying. Valerie Phillips organized an Atlantic Province Association of Communication Teachers Conference. It explored media multitasking, a term associated with the use of computers and the internet. The, that's kind of a myth, uh, that whole multitasking idea. Phillips says the idea of media multitasking takes away from our ability to focus. If you can set aside all distractions, your ability to retain information will increase. You need to shut off all the other distractions and even your phones and, and all of that and focus on, on a subject for, you know, 20, even 20 minutes. UMB professor of education Ellen Rose says we break up our limited attention resources into smaller pieces when media multitasking. Rose says eliminating distractions and our compulsion to be connected, you can accomplish more. In Woodstock, Kyle DuPont, Community College News. Cell phones are not just for calling people these days. Many are now using them for educational purposes. Jill Constantine tells us how phones are being integrated into the educational system. Cell phones are usually seen as a nuisance in the classroom, but things are changing. Companies are now creating cell phone apps designed for learning. Many students are in favor of using their phones as a resource in the classroom. I have one of the apps that we were, um, it was suggested to us to buy and it was quite inexpensive but I know it's a huge help and it's a huge time saver other than have to flip through hundreds and hundreds of pages, you just type one thing in and it's there. For educational purposes I don't see a problem but you know I think for other reasons they probably should be turned off. Because it's like using a computer if you have a smartphone, go on the internet and look up stuff. It's a lot quicker if you have it in your pocket, you don't have to go sit in front of the computer. Nursing instructor Nicole Crusett uses Nursing Central. She believes that the app is a great tool for her students. And very quickly look, what is this for, you know, how, what's the dose they should be on, and it's right there at the fingertips. And it's tiny, they can carry that in their pockets all the time. Um, I really, really strongly would recommend my students to have that app. Crusett thinks that the app is a great learning resource. Other teachers are also finding value with having cell phones in the classroom, but it may be a while before we see such acceptance with everyone in the teaching community. In Woodstock, Jill Constantine, Community College News. 
Carpentry and electrical students have been working together at MBCC Woodstock to complete a task that would bring them closer together once they enter the workforce. Jillian Trainer has more. Carpentry students are building footers, which go underneath the foundation walls of houses. Eventually, the electrical students will join them. This is not the first time the two trades have worked together. Quite often we'll frame walls inside the shop and then they'll come and wire the walls and put the outlets on and so on. The students are working on setting up temporary power supplies. Those are for supplying temporary power to the house as it's uh, getting constructed. Um, it's only there until uh, MB Power comes along and hooks up the actual power to the house, to the panel. Electrical instructor Alan Sarchfield feels it is important that the trade students work together while they are still in school. As the trades work on the jobs, of course, the different trades need to cooperate with each other and they need to learn how they can uh, work in mixed groups and so on and how one trade can even help the other trade on jobs. He thinks they need to do more of this. It's a very, very good experience for the guys to be able to do that. This will not be the last time carpentry and electrical students work together. Eventually, they'll work with plumbing students as well. In Woodstock, Jillian Trainer, Community College News. Coming up, in your journalism showcase, MBCC Woodstock shows off their Halloween spirit. Bonjour, je m'appelle Samantha et je viens de l'école St. Mary's Academy. J'ai visité le collège du Nouveau-Brunswick à Woodstock et j'ai fait le tour de la classe de journalisme et autres. Et mon programme préféré est la criminologie. Pour plus d'informations ou d'histoires sur au, de NBCC, allez au site internet gcschoolnbcc.ca. Have an interesting story idea? Email the NBCC Woodstock journalism team at jschoolnbcc at gmail.com. Your idea could be in our next show. Halloween is a time of year when many houses are decorated as ghastly and ghoulishly as possible. In Moncton, one house takes the Halloween decorating cake further than most. Martin Poirier visited this house to find out why. You would be hard pressed to miss this house on Broadview Street. With everything from zombies to alien brides, this property is the most haunted place in the city. For many of us, decorating for Halloween is a small affair. But for one family in Moncton, it has reached a whole new level. Bob and Bonnie Griffith are working hard to finish last-minute details. This family is serious about Halloween. They start early. It starts in about September when the kids go back to school and they all say, Oh, there's the Halloween house. There is more to this house than its ghoulish exterior. Their efforts are also helping the greater good of the community. People from Calgary come by and suggest that we do a food drive for the food bank. So that's how we started eight years ago. And, and in eight years, they've raised 4,800 pounds of food and about $5,600. One year we raised $1,635 and about 700 pounds of food. Pretty near every year for the last five, we raised at least 700. So it's down a little bit, but then so is the economy, so. The Griffith family is urging anyone who stops by to bring non-perishable food items or to make a donation. We'll continue until, you know, I guess forever, maybe <laughs> somebody else takes it over. For this family, Hallow's Eve isn't just about tricks or treats. It's about the spirit of giving. In Moncton, Martin Poirier, Community College News. MBCC campuses got into the spirit of Oh Hallow's Eve. There was a stabbing, <laughs> scooping, and many different faces. The Woodstock campus showed off their spirits for the haunted holiday with a pumpkin carving contest. It's a learning experience because I'm a computer guy. I don't play with pumpkins, I play with computers. Probably gonna stick it in the window at my apartment because it's the only place you'll be able to see it. <laughs> Although Jason Tompkins says he was forced into the pumpkin carving contest by classmates, he enjoyed the experience. But I find it very intriguing and artistic. <laughs> the competitors finished their carvings. All eight entries were judged by the cafeteria staff. The judges picked between the hand of a god, a cat, Jack from the Nightmare Before Christmas, and other funny faces. First place was won by Tasha Ann Palmer. 
Second, by Jessica Chapel, And third place by Jason Tompkins. Winners were awarded with up to $15 in cafeteria cash. And now for our editorial. When choosing a post-secondary educational institute, many students wonder, which is right for me? University or college? Kyle DuPont has thought about this, and here is his conclusion. I'm a university graduate and a college student. Like most college students, I have developed some strong opinions on our state of post-secondary education. As a 17-year-old high school grad, I had no idea where I wanted to go. All my friends were planning to go to universities across the country, and I figured that was the only option. With little to no guidance in high school, I was unaware of my options. I enrolled at Trent University as a history major, only to transfer to Brock the following year. Throughout university, I blindly went through the motions along with the thousands of other numbers attending school. I say numbers because in the large scheme of thing, I think university students are not treated as individuals. Over 40 different courses and 30 different profs, I only think three actually knew my name. You may think this was my own fault, or was it the institutional's understanding of the significantly high dropout rate in post-secondary education? Thousands of fresh high school grads are accepted into university every fall. According to StatsCan, more than one out of seven drop out by spring. And more students will drop out in years two and three. Why? Because students don't know what they want to do. And some cannot afford the high tuition. If people knew this, would as many people attend? I don't think so. Universities need the high intake of students in order to pay for professors' research. So do they care if students leave? Students they don't even know. It's just another number gone. I was one of the lucky ones to survive university. But what I came out with was a piece of paper which actually had my name on it, not my number, and no real job opportunities unless I opted for more schooling. And I was saddled with over $20,000 in debt. Now compare the cost between university and college. The elite world of university will cost you at least 20 k and no promise of employment. For a quarter of the cost, you can achieve an education with hands-on training to truly prepare you for a career. Consider this before you pay that $5,000 a year tuition. With small class sizes and the opportunity to actually know your instructors, my experience has been astronomically enhanced. Being in class for eight hours a day, five days a week may seem crazy, but it will prepare you for the real world. Unlike my university experience, where I gained little to no valuable work skills. Between going back to university or college for journalism, the choice was clear. The reality is I would not gain the full rounded experience I wanted. I would be taking courses that in no way, shape or form had anything to do with journalism. The point of my rant here is to let people know there are more viable options in university. Secondary school systems tend to create a notion that college is for the less educated. By having university and college stream courses, many kids are unaware of what they may be setting themselves up for or missing. It seems as though many people entering post-secondary education are being pushed into the university stream overpaying for an education that does not always prepare them with real life skills needed to succeed in the workforce. This is my view from my own experiences. I know that there are a tremendous amount of people out there who have succeeded in life through university, but college can offer you something that is totally different that you may not see on the surface. That's our show for today. Stay tuned for other journalism showcases. For more of our work, visit us at jschoolmbcc.ca. Thanks for watching.